So my name is Joshua Bergen. I am the Director and General Manager for Compute Services at AWS. It's a small startup. You may have heard of it. Uh, I was one of Amazon's first 100 employees, uh, and I left and came back. We call that being a boomerang. So back then, we only sold books. We, we do a little bit more than that now. I've been with AWS for almost five years uh, in this role, own a bunch of businesses inside of Compute, many of which I'm here to talk to you about today. So a uh, quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are at your first reInvent? That is, that, is, that is most of the audience. Uh, how many of you are using AWS today? It's good, good. How many keep raising their hands just because everybody else is? Yeah, this, yeah it's good over here. All right. Uh, so obviously, we're here to talk about being better, faster, cheaper. And those are not ors. Those are ands. You can be all of those things. So if you're not here for that session, you're going to have to stay anyway. Uh, so, you know, tough. Uh, kidding. There's no, uh, there's no test at the end of this. Maybe, maybe there'll be a test. I don't know. Uh, but you, you do have to stay all the way to the end for these credits that you've, uh, we've been handing out to be active. So I, I know how to kind of optimize for the audience. So in this session, this is what you're going to learn, right? Your key takeaways are the best practices that you can use today to optimize your cost of compute and to optimize your capacity. We're going to also talk about how you automate this, right? Uh, I've been giving this session for a few years, and we've made significant strides in the software that you use to automate this. I don't want this to be a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting. I don't know if we've got it all perfect, but I like to think that some of the things we've released that I'm talking about go a long way to making this easy for you. We're also going to go through a few specific workloads. I can't go through all of them tonight, but hopefully these are practical examples that you can think of workloads inside your own organization, whether you're big or small, startup, research, enterprise. Hopefully they resonate with you. And then obviously we've given you uh, $50 in Amazon EC2 spot credit to get started. And if you're not familiar with spot, right, that's another poll question. How many of you are using spot? This is the smart, handsome people in the room. Uh, this is a really great way that you can optimize, and we're going to kind of go over that in more detail. So I've kind of gone over this, right? This is the agenda. We're going to go over general best practices, what the software is underneath for automating cost optimization, go through those workload examples, I have a special guest star here from Lyft. It's one of our great customers. He's going to come up and speak for a few minutes about how they're putting all of this into practice at their company. And then we're going to wrap up with next steps. So these are the four core principles of using AWS effectively. The first one is elasticity. So that's using features like auto-scaling uh, to scale dynamically up and down, using our new machine learning technology that does predictive scaling, uh, using something like uh, Hibernate, which is a new feature we just launched for on-demand. We launched it for Spot last year. It's also about turning instances off that you're not using. If you're migrating to AWS from on-prem, it may not seem inherently obvious, but you can turn things off, especially if you're using on-demand or Spot, and save significant amounts of money. Another core principle is being flexible. So that means using different instance types, different availability zones inside of one of our regions, using the different purchase options, and I'll kind of go into those. You're also going to be using features that we make uh, available to you to identify which workloads are costing you maybe more than they should, and then give you the ability to kind of dashboard the savings for your bosses. Anybody in this room have a boss? Right? Everybody else probably is the boss. Maybe you're kind of both. So like th this actually is pretty important, right? If you're just doing a bunch of stuff and throwing it up there to see what sticks, you want to be able to identify, what am I doing that's working? What are the areas that need more investment? Where are the areas where maybe I could save money, but the ROI would actually be pretty small? So I'm going to tell you how you can do that. And then lastly, kind of a quick show of hands, how many people are migrating something to AWS? OK, a lot of you. So hopefully this will be relevant. So even if you don't have a cloud-native workload, if you've got kind of traditional enterprise workloads, HPC, batch, a lot of these things can benefit from what I'm going to talk about today. You know, re-engineering to be cloud native, to be more stateless, fault tolerant, use containers, those are great, and I will talk about that. But there is uh, nothing that says that's what you have to do to save money. So I mentioned this best practices here uh, on the previous slide. These are uh, really the key one you're going to start with is tagging. So tagging is metadata, where you can use kind of up to 50 tags, which are just key value pairs that you can put any text in. And what it'll help you do is identify 
which applications are uh, running and using different resources. So for example, you could tag an instance and say, this is part of my website. It's part of the dev test part of my website, or it's part of the gamma environment, or it's part of the production environment. Maybe it was launched by Joshua, it was launched by Matt. And eventually, you know, all the tagging, you can kind of analyze it using our kind of cost explorer and other tools that we provide. And then you can actually answer questions like, how much does my website cost? Or are my dev test environments being run all the time? Are people using the RIs that I purchased, or are they launching other instances? So tagging is a super important principle. Uh, the tags are free, no charge, just for you. Uh, so custom tags, these are really important, and it's really basic, but people kind of forget this step sometimes. The other thing is there's three core pieces of software, and I'm gonna talk about them today. So EC2 Fleet, this is an API that we released back in May, and it's actually core to a number of the cost optimization technology. Launch templates, which are a way to kind of encapsulate uh, all of the launch parameters for EC2 instances, and auto-scaling. Anybody using auto-scaling right now? Also, this is pretty, pretty common, right? It's actually used by, I think, something like 97% of our large customers. And it's not something you have to use, and I'm gonna talk about things uh, that don't use auto-scaling, but it is a really powerful tool for kind of set it and forget it, uh, cost optimization and capacity management. So why does this work for you? Or you take all these principles. Uh, AWS is kind of always working on your behalf when it comes to things like cost optimization. So obviously it seems pretty basic now, but one of the innovations of the cloud was that you didn't require upfront investment to get started with technology. You didn't have to go buy a data center, make a deal with a colo, sign up for a one-year lease, a three-year lease, a five-year lease. It's also pay-as-you-go, which is a pretty flexible tool. That's true for both on-demand and for spot. You also can pay less when you commit, because we do recognize that, of course, for some people, it'd actually be easier to make a one- or a three-year commitment for a significant discount. And then lastly, you pay less when we get bigger. So this is that famous Amazon customer obsession working on your behalf. We've had over 66 price cuts in AWS on EC2 over the last 10 years, and that's where we're using our economy of scale across all of these regions, all the hardware types that we offer, all the instances, and we're passing that savings along to you. And I'm actually gonna spend a little bit of time talking about how hardware innovations that you may have heard of, especially if you went to Monday Night's Talk by Peter DeSantis, how that actually translates into savings that's almost invisible, but is uh, really powerful. So I've mentioned purchase options a few times, and you heard me talk about Spot. It's a product that's pretty near and dear to my heart. We actually have three purchasing options in EC2. Most of you are familiar with on-demand. That's the pay-as-you-go, just get started, fire up an instance, no upfront commitment, no long-term commitments. You're billed by the second. This is the kind of thing you're gonna be using for spiky workloads, defining your needs, things that can't be interrupted, or where you're not certain kind of what instance type to use or how it's gonna perform. Then we have RIs. This is where I mentioned you make a one or a three year commitment and you make a significant savings over the on-demand price. This is really good for your steady state workloads. Maybe your database is running on this. Things that you're never turning off and it would actually make no sense to turn off. And then lastly, spot instances. So this is spare EC2 capacity where you save between 70 and 90%. And then the only difference between this and on-demand besides the savings is that uh, we can reclaim these instances with a two-minute notification if we need it back for on-demand capacity usage. And before I leave this slide, I wanna mention that people hear that and they kind of think like, how am I gonna know how to use it? So I'll go into how we use software uh, to make it easier to use spot instances in your production environments. But uh, a little statistic I'd like to share is that 95% of spot instances were terminated by the customer. So that just means you finished your workload, turned off the instance, moved on to something else. So between two and 5% of the time, on average, you might be interrupted by AWS with that two minute notification. And there's tooling you can use, like our Hibernate feature, stop, start. Uh, but if you're using a stateless workload, two minutes is a really long time if your API tier responds in 100 milliseconds. You can just drain from the ELB and kind of move on with life. So these are the three core purchasing options. And another thing that sometimes trips people up who are new to AWS, there's no difference in the hardware that's underneath these. You can really think of these as financial constructs. So all of the different instance types, the ones you heard about, like the A1 with our ARM processor, AMD, all of our Intel choices from the biggest 12 terabyte X1 instances to the tiniest you know, T2, T3 instances, all of those are available in all of these purchasing models. 
and they have the same capabilities, right? The same features, the same functionality. There might be more or less capacity available for spot or for on-demand, but it's just a financial construct. Uh, I mentioned this Hibernate feature. If you have an application and you're coming from the on-premises world, it might take a long time for that application to boot up, right? So the instance might boot quickly, but then you do a bunch of bootstrapping, right? You get the application into, into memory and you kind of load data from disk. You can now use Hibernate, both for on-demand and since last year for spot, to get that application into a known good state and then hibernate it, then when it launches the next time, it's that much faster. So in a subtle way, that seems like a kind of cool feature, but how does that save you money? Well, if you build by the second and you have a short-lived workload and it takes 30 minutes less to get started, that's 30 minutes of savings right there. So even features that just seem like interesting convenience features, like pre-warming your instances, can also be a way that you save money. I'd say that for the end, I'm sorry. Uh, when I talk about instances, you know, these are what we would refer to as different servers or different server types, or you might hear them as VMs. But we have 175 different instance types. So that includes different sizes, different families, different processors. And as you see here in this curve, there's been this bend upwards. And what's happened is that uh, innovations that we have made on the hardware side to make it easier for us and more cost effective to manage this virtualized at scale environment over uh, you know, 60 availability zones, 18 different regions with another four that have been announced. This hardware advantage that we call the Nitro platform has turned into our ability to launch more instance types for you. I think we're launched something like three times as many instance types in the last year as we did the previous year. So you see these couple of arrows where it says Nitro for networking and then the C5 and M5 Nitro instances. So the more experience we got with Nitro and the broader it became used on our platform, the faster we were able to innovate. So what is Nitro? So Nitro is a modular building block that enables us, as I mentioned, to rapidly deliver new instance types. If any of you are familiar with how virtualization technology works, uh, you have a hypervisor that protects the physical hardware and the BIOS. It virtualizes the CPU, storage, networking, and then it has a rich set of management capabilities across the top. So this isn't something that we invented, obviously. There's VMware, there's KVM, there's been other hypervisor technologies. But with 10 years of experience operating an at-scale virtualized environment, what we figured out was if we break apart all of those functions into separate modular components, we can offload them onto physical hardware that we develop that allows us to reduce cost by delivering nearly all of the physical hardware to you, even in this virtualized environment. So again, I want to spend a little time explaining why that matters. In a virtualized environment, like a VMware type environment, or a KVM if you're on premise, about 25 to 33% of your physical hardware is given over to your, kind of your hypervisor, right? That's what you need. You gain a lot of advantages, like you can rapidly provision and deprovision, and you can make sure there's security and policies in place. But you lose that hardware. Sometimes people also complain that in comparison to bare metal, you lose some of the performance by having this virtualization overhead. On our Nitro instances, you get 99% bare metal performance, and somewhere between 95 and 99% of the physical hardware is given over to you, the customer. So why does that matter for cost? Well, think about if, uh, you know, for every seat in this room, all of you brought a backpack, right? And you had to put it on the seat next to you. If instead, I can have you put your backpacks under the chair, I can fit a lot more people in this room. More people I can fit in this room, more people I can deliver this message to in the same amount of time. So this actually turns into a structural cost advantage for AWS in that we're able to put that many more you know, virtual servers, instances, in the same physical space. And this isn't the kind of innovation that's going to make a lot of sense. If you're running a colo or uh, you know, an on-premise data center with a couple thousand VMs, this isn't the kind of innovation that you're going to invest in because it's not cost effective. But at the scale we're operating at, it makes sense for us to develop our own uh, security chips and cards to offload networking and our own hypervisor. And it's also something that allows us to innovate and develop things like Firecracker, which is a lightweight uh, VM environment for containers and serverless. We talked about that on Monday night as well. So this is kind of working for you invisibly under the scenes. It makes it move faster for us. Kind of a win-win. 
When I talked about all 175 of those instances, and uh, someone just told me this is actually now already out of date, and we're going to have 200 of these by the end of the year. So I need to have like a real-time slide service that updates this. But we kind of, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the different instance types. You're going to find one or two or three that are probably right for your workloads. And on a given wor any given workload, unless you're uh, making super heavy use of spot, you might only use one instance type. But the wor it kind of generally divides into these three uh, capability sets. So you kind of think about what workload do I have? Is it general purpose? Uh, is it memory intensive? Is, does it need a lot of storage? Am I using GPUs to do machine learning or deep learning? Then kind of which capability do I need? Do I need the latest Intel Skylake processors? Am I fine on AMD? Uh, do I have a scale out workload like a LAMP stack that isn't CPU intensive? Could I save 45% by using a pretty small A1 instance on our ARM uh, chip, the Graviton? Do I need the fastest processor? Do I need to attach uh, Elastic Graphics to kind of do a little graphics workload? Or attach our new Elastic Inference service where you can attach a little bit of GPU to a compute instance? So you're just going to think about what your business needs are, and then these instances are going to become kind of obvious which ones you pick. But here, picking the right instance can also be a cost savings. So if you are coming, uh, an analogy, or excuse me, an example I like to use is we have people inside of Amazon who've developed software that's been around 10, 15 years. So as they've been moving it and kind of migrating it to uh, more modern parts of AWS, we are our, you know, a customer of ourselves, I'll talk to these teams because one of my jobs is to make our own teams more efficient in how they use AWS. And I'll say, why are you using this instance with eight gigs of RAM? And they'll say, well, my application needs eight gigs of RAM. And I'll say, like, playing dumb, right? Like, why, why don't, how do you know that? And they're like, well, the provisioning script says it needs eight gigs of RAM. And I'm like, have you tried a T3? And they're like, I've never tried a T3. It turns out, significant amounts of our applications are not CPU bound. Some are, obviously. Some need a C5 or an M5. Some are processing you know, big in-memory data sets, and they need an X1. But a lot of applications, you'd be surprised, and you could just use on-demand or spot to test this out, how well they would perform on just a smaller size of the same instance or on a smaller instance family, like the T's, which are our oversubscribed kind of burstable instances. So that's another way you can save money, just by experimenting with which instance type you're using for your applications. This is especially true if you have back office applications. Maybe you developed them in-house. They're you know, five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. The chances are pretty good. You don't need the latest Skylake processors for those. Uh, and then chances are, if you've developed an application in the last 10 years on pretty much any language, it's probably chipset agnostic. So maybe you can look at AMD, save 10 or 15%. Or maybe like that example I used earlier with the LAMP stack. We have some tests that we've already shown 45% savings for these applications that really scale out and only need like a large number of kind of very small instances with one or two CPUs. On the other side of things, maybe you really need a capacity reservation. RIs are great, and these days with regional RIs, you don't need to kind of think about what availability zone they're in. But if you need a certain amount of uh, RI coverage, historically, uh, with reservations, historically, your only option was zonal RIs, which tied the discount and the capacity reservation together. So we've split those apart now, and you can use on-demand capacity reservations to cover either your RIs or your on-demand usage, where you do things like red-black deployments, and maybe you really want to make sure the other cluster is spun up, uh, uh, stood up before uh, you kind of flip over. This isn't something that most of you are going to use, but it's another way to save money where you can get a capacity reservation for a very small portion of your fleet where you really need it, and then everything else where you're using spot or on demand or you're keeping it running all the time, you don't need to deal with the overhead of having all of your instances kind of you know, running 100% of the time just to maintain the very small amount that needs this reservation feature. So the takeaway from this section with these three purchasing options is that if you're going to optimize costs on EC2, I'm going to pause for dramatic effect. You need to combine the purchasing options. It, it, it trips people up. They're like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out which one I'm going to use. I'm going to centralize on that. Uh, that's like picking one food that you like and eating only that food the rest of your life. Uh, every so often, I meet someone who says that's what they do. But most people like to combine things. So you're going to use RIs, as I mentioned, for steady state workloads, on demand for scaling up for things that can't be interrupted. And then you're going to use spot for your fault tolerant, flexible, stateless workloads. Now, each of your applications might use a different percent of these. 
So I mentioned earlier, like, you know, if you're running a database, are you going to run it on spot? No. Yeah, there's good, good, good head nods here, right? I will not answer your trouble tickets uh, if, you, if your database crashes because you're running it on spot. But even with a database, you might have an ETL job that runs once a week or overnight. Maybe that can run on spot. If you're running a website, you're going to run a base of on-demand and a lot of spot. And, and every workload's going to be different in terms of percentages, but I want you to think about it this way. It's very rare that I run into a customer that's 100% spot and no RIs, or 100% on-demand and no RIs, or 100% RIs and no spot. Uh, if I do run into those people, typically they're actually not as cost-optimized as they like to think they are. And you people seem very smart, so you're going you're gonna to follow this. Now, I keep mentioning software and automation. Uh, we've tried to make this easier. So those general best practices, you could go out and implement them yourself. You could figure out what percent you want to use of spot and OD and RI. You can use our run instances API, which is the core API used to launch EC2 instances. Uh, and then you can just launch your instances, and you can build your own orchestration layer. And if any of you have been using AWS for a long time, this may have actually been something you did. We have now made this a lot easier. So with EC2 Fleet, which I'll talk about uh, in a little more depth, which is now integrated with auto-scaling. Uh, it's integrated with our Elastic Container Service, ECS. It's integrated with our Kubernetes Management Service, EKS. If you do any rendering, like image rendering, we have a tool from a company that we uh, acquired called Thinkbox. They use this technology. You use EMR for Hadoop and Spark workloads. Even if you use some of these third parties here, right, Kubol, if you use Terraform instead of CloudFormation, if you use Jenkins, uh, if you use Kubernetes in a native fashion on AWS, we're trying to make it possible that whatever choice you make, whichever one's right for you, the practices that I'm talking about here, the software, it's embedded in the application. So I'm not here to tell you you need to kind of rebuild your entire application architecture to save money. You just need to think about how you incorporate this into what you're already doing. You don't have to take my word for it, although uh, I think I'm reasonably uh, correct. So we have these customer references here to kind of give you an idea of all the different companies that are putting these practices uh, into place. So for example, uh, Mobileye, this is an autonomous driving company based in Israel. They chose AWS as their preferred cloud provider. And what they told us is that jobs that would take weeks in their data center, they can now do them in hours on EC2 by making pretty heavy use of Spot. So that's really powerful when you think about how much more you can do how much more work you can get done in a short amount of time. Or there's a company named Illumina, which does genetic testing. And they offer this gene sequencing uh, technology and software to a lot of uh, labs and research institutions around the world. They were able to cut their costs by 75%. And that turns into being able to offer their service more inexpensively to customers, which enables a lot more companies who, or research institutions who want to offer genetic testing or use gene sequencing like a children's hospital, suddenly that's within their reach, whereas before, it was too expensive. There's another company, AdRoll, that I like to talk about. So they're doing real-time bidding. This is a really spot-friendly workload. It's extremely stateless. They're processing 100 billion requests a day by making really heavy use of spot. So an average response time of kind of 90 milliseconds, it's a lot shorter than those small percentage of interruptions that they're going to face. And even then, they have two minutes to kind of drain connections and move on. So using Spot has enabled them to save over $3 million a year. So that's a pretty big cost reduction. Uh, or maybe $3 million isn't that big for you. Uh, it is for me. So I've talked a lot about kind of uh, what I want you to do. Now I'm going to enter into the portion of the how I want you to do this. So these are the three core technologies. I mentioned this before. EC2 Fleet which is an API, launch templates, uh, which is a service that uh, I'm going to talk about, and then auto-scaling groups. So again, not everything is going to be using auto-scaling groups, but for a large majority of your workloads, these are the technologies that you're going to be using. So what is launch templates? It uh, reduces the number of steps that it takes to by a launch an instance by capturing all of the launch parameters in a single template. Uh, it makes it easier to roll out changes to your standard launch configurations, enforce policies. It even has versioning and aliasing. So that's, you know, you can kind of rev how you like instances to be launched uh, behind the scenes and then have your auto-scaling group automatically pick up 
the new launch template and then launch the new instances for you. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. There's a number of other sessions about this. It's a really powerful tool. Uh, we think people will like it. Uh, and you can use this with uh, cloud formation, auto scaling, uh, EC2 fleet, and AWS batch. So these are other services you can use to kind of automate your provisioning. So launch templates are kind of a, a really powerful low level primitive. And speaking of primitives, I mentioned Amazon EC2 fleet. So this was an API that we launched in May that automates the process of combining the different purchase models and combining the different instance types in a single launch call. So you can reduce costs, increase your efficiency. You can mix instance types, purchase models, mix availability zones. This is a synchronous API, if that's what you want. And by synchronous, uh, if you've used run instances, you send in a request, you get back your instance IDs, and then of course that allows you from an orchestration perspective to go do something with that instance ID. EC2 Fleet works exactly the same way. You send in a request for how much on-demand you want, how much RIs, how much spot you want, whether you want us to kind of prioritize cost or uh, diversification, and whether you want us to do it differently on the on-demand side or differently on the spot side. We just do that, we send you back the instance IDs, you can move on with your life. We've even released features uh, recently, like uh, I talked about mixing instance types. Maybe you have a cluster that could use a C5 or an M5, but it would kind of perform strangely if they were both together. Well, with EC2 Fleet, you can specify that you want one or the other, but with a single instance option, we'll, we'll pick you know, whichever one is kind of either the lowest cost or the most available, depending on what you've told us. We also have a feature coming in the next couple weeks that we call Single AZ. So what this allows you to do, imagine you're a Hadoop workload or Spark, and you want to have all your instances in a single AZ, but you want us to pick this cheapest availability zone. Before, you actually had to kind of go hunt and look at the spot prices and figure out which availability zone was the cheapest. And if it's the cheapest right now, it might not be the cheapest in an hour or the cheapest tomorrow. Prices are pretty smooth with spot these days, but they do vary kind of over the weeks. Now you can specify, I want to use AZs 1, 2, 3, and 5, but I want all of my instances to be in one AZ when you launch it. And we will factor in capacity, price, availability, and kind of launch your instances in the cheapest AZ or the best AZ for what you're looking for. So these are uh, really powerful features, and we built them as a low-level primitive, as an API, partially because that's how we do things, but secondly, because we hear from a lot of people that they don't want to use a managed service. They prefer to kind of build their own provisioning framework. This is what allows you to do that. So if you're using run instances today and using a lot of custom code, you could pretty much replace that with EC2 Fleet right now. We've also embedded it with these other services. So these other services are just calling this API. So auto scaling, which is also what powers scaling for ECS, EKS, batch. Uh, it also powers scaling for OpsWorks and Beanstalk. So for those first ones, this EC2 fleet functionality is already available. So if you're using auto scaling, you can kind of leave this classroom later and put this stuff into practice, and off you go. You don't have to switch off auto scaling to use EC2 fleet. It also supports cloud formation. There's other AWS services like GameLift, uh, Thinkbox, EMR. All of these either have EC2 fleet or they will have EC2 fleet in the near future underneath it. So you don't actually have to learn the new API. I also mentioned third parties. We love our partners. Uh, we know that uh, how many of you are using Jenkins to do CI CD? A fair number of you. So there is a spot plugin, uh, EC2 fleet plugin for this that I'll kind of go into in detail. Or if you like Terraform over CloudFormation, uh, kind of funny, they actually launched support for EC2 fleet uh, the day we launched support for auto scaling, and CloudFormation took a couple of extra days. So that shows you how tightly we continue to work with our partners. Or if you use Kubel, which is a managed service for Hadoop and Spark and other workloads, we work very closely with them to kind of bring these capacities, uh, capabilities to you. So auto scaling, why is this so powerful? Uh, why does it matter? How many are you, are you, most of you are using auto scaling? I heard this earlier. So, uh, you know, at, at a basic level, this is what you're going to want to use for fleet management if you're using any number of EC2 instances more than one. So the health checks feature, which detects unhealthy hosts and replaces them, that there's, there's really like no reason not to use this and to build it yourself. You can also use it to uh, dynamically scale kind of up and down based on thresholds and metrics that you set. And then you can use it to lower your costs, of course, by descaling when you don't need those instances. 
So fundamentally, inside of autoscaling, you have an autoscaling group. It's just a logical group of instances. You can set a minimum and a maximum, set what your desired capacity is. It's pretty straightforward. This has existed for about uh, between three and five years, kind of this concept. What's new is that we embedded the EC2 fleet functionality. Now you can save up to 90% by using autoscaling without actually also having to combine spot fleet or run instances to launch spot. So you basically specify whether you want us, for your autoscaling group, to use lowest cost as your strategy. Do you create a prioritized list? Uh, I mentioned single availability zones. We even have a new feature called minimum instances. We noticed that a lot of customers would ask for like 1,000 instances. And if we didn't have them right now, they would start backing off, right? They'd ask for 900, 800, 700, until maybe we were, you know, had the instances. And then later, they would come and add them. Now you don't have to do that. You can tell us, look, my application can't start if I have less than 100 instances. My desired amount is 1,000. And if we don't have 100, we'll just tell you no. But if we do have 100, we'll launch them, and then we'll keep trying to find the rest of the instances as we have them. So the idea here is to kind of reduce your orchestration overhead. That's the repeated theme. Uh, so how does this actually work? Uh, all of these customers, uh, I was going to put like a, you know, celebrities read mean tweets kind of thing up here, but there were no mean tweets. Uh, actually, the only mean tweets were where people were saying, like, we just made them throw out 300 lines of code that they'd written to do this same feature. Uh, and my, my favorite tweet up here is the one that says, spot instances are the holy grail of AWS. They are like a chaos monkey that pays you. So this is kind of a really powerful feature. Customers have been adopting it. We only released it two weeks ago, and it's really taken off. So how does it, how, why have they taken off? This is what it used to look like. Remember those auto-scaling groups I talked about? If you just wanted to use the same instance type and use spot and on-demand, or spot and RIs, you had to create two auto-scaling groups. If you wanted to use lots of different spot instances to maximize your capacity, you had to create a spot group, auto-scaling group for each of those. Then you had to orchestrate between them, depending on when the capacity went up and down. Or even on the on-demand side, if you wanted to create a primary instance type where 99% you know, of the time we have the capacity, but some small amount of time where you spike up, like your Epic Games, where they're spinning up 1.1 you know, million instances when they release a new update to Fortnite, you'd have to create different auto-scaling groups and different policies when we didn't have the first instance type. So all of this is now a thing of the past. Now you can create one auto-scaling group. You can still create more than one. Each of your applications is going to have their own auto-scaling group. Maybe your dev test environment, your production environment, those are going to be different auto-scaling groups. But for each of them, you create one auto-scaling group, one set of scaling policies. You combine the instance types. You tell us what percentage mix of kind of on-demand and RI, what percentage mix of spot. If you want to use different instance types for the on-demand side, maybe you purchased RIs only for a certain couple instance types, and then you want to use another kind of instance type or a whole set of instance types for spot, we support that. So we just made capacity management and cost optimization this easy. So single auto-scaling group, I think it's pretty slick. Another feature we just released last week, try to get all my feature launches out ahead of reInvent, uh, is something we call predictive scaling. So EC2 auto scaling has manual scaling. It's had this for a long time. You just go into the console, right, or make an API call and tell us to increase the number of instances you want. We have scheduled scaling, you know, where you can schedule things to turn on and off if you have predictable peaks. Dynamic scaling, where you set a threshold like number of jobs in a queue or CPU load or some other metric that determines your application performance. And now we have predictive scaling. Predictive scaling is proactively responding to changes using machine learning. We actually built this. Uh, it, it scales in advance of your traffic. Why do you want to do this? Well, first off, it's faster. If you're scaling in advance of when the traffic's actually going to come in, that means you never have a period of time where your application is underperforming. Also, we prevent descaling. So like maybe you have a transient dip in your traffic for five minutes or 10 minutes. If you're using a simple dynamic scaling rule like CPU threshold, Auto scaling will just blindly scale down. And then if your usage goes way back up five minutes later, it's going to have to scale back up again. And it's also simpler. Trying to figure out, do you have multiple peaks a day? Are the peaks different on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday? Is it different every weekend? That's kind of fairly hard for you to do in a manual fashion. So how does this work? We use machine learning algorithms leveraged from almost 20 years of data 
with billions of traffic patterns across Amazon.com, then that pre-trained model uses two weeks of your own data to forecast the load metrics for the next two days. Every day, it performs a regression analysis between that load metric and the scaling metric. So what does it think it's going to do? What should it do? It schedules scaling actions for the next two days and then repeats this process every day. So it gets smarter over time. It's already pretty smart out of the box. So what's cool about it, as I mentioned, is it also prevents descaling. So what you see here in the bottom graphs, if you manually scaled, you could simply create uh, as many instances as you need to hit your peak. But then you're wasting money during all these valleys where you're not using the capacity. If you use dynamic scaling, you can see it kind of hugs your usage graph pretty closely. But if you look closely, there are a couple of things where it scales down well after your peak. You know, that's kind of money that you're wasting in a sense. And it also scales up after you need it. And then there's that weird part where it dips. That's that descaling that I mentioned. So dynamic scaling scaled back down. If you look at predictive scaling, it hugs that curve much more tightly. So it's not running instances when you don't need it. It prevents descaling. And it's kind of a set it and forget it thing. This is really the beginning of the journey for us in the auto scaling team, which is uh, part of my org. And I think this is really powerful. Uh, hopefully, uh, you will too. Of course, we would love to hear your feedback. So I mentioned this earlier. This is the basic technology, launch templates, EC2 fleet, auto scaling. Now I'm going to go into three specific workload examples and show you how you put this into practice. So these are all the kinds of workloads you could do on AWS. I mentioned I've only got time to cover three. Hopefully you see a pattern, if it isn't one of these three examples, that fits one of the other examples that you're running. So we're going to start with big data and analytics. So maybe you're using EMR. Maybe you're running your own Hadoop or Spark pipeline. Maybe you've got a batch workload that has like a grid of worker nodes. They're all kind of the same. The idea here is that you include Spot alongside your kind of core uh, nodes that don't go down that are running on on-demand or RI. And so you, know, you can process massive amounts of data from the human genome to the fire hose of Twitter data to get semantic analysis. Uh, this is a really common use case for Spot, as you saw from those customer examples. So what is the reference architecture here? Kind of how does this work? So what you see here is we have a master node, and yours might not look exactly like this. That's something that can never go down. It's controlling all the worker nodes. It's controlling your data store. So you're going to run that on on-demand or RI, typically. Then if you're running Hadoop, you might also be using HDFS. You don't want those nodes to go down. Uh, in Hadoop terminology, those are kind of uh, core nodes. You're going to run those on OD or RI, depending on whether it's a short-lived cluster or a long-lived cluster. But then all of your task nodes, your task fleet, or in Spark terminology, your processors, or your worker nodes if you're using batch, all of those guys are running on spot. Because your master node can handle starting them up, spinning up more, spinning them down. If one of them fails, it knows you know, kind of where you checkpointed and where to come back. And so that is really powerful. You might have as many as 10x the number of task nodes that you do core nodes or master nodes. Now, I said you're probably running your core nodes, your master nodes on on-demand or RI. If you have a time-insensitive batch workload, or if it's really short-lived, you know, two hours, three hours, four hours, you could run the entire thing on spot. So you're going to have to decide for yourself kind of what level of orchestration overhead you want to put in, what your workload looks like. Is it long-lived, short-lived? But there are multiple ways to save money here. One of our customers, Move It, they're running 95% of their production Hadoop fleet on spot instances, 95%. So like, they're saving 70 to 90% on 95% of their compute bill, which is, I think, 80% of their total bill, right? So that's, that's a pretty powerful amount of savings. Uh, another company we like to mention is uh, Zillow. So they are uh, blending, as I mentioned, kind of OD, RI, and spot to run these hundreds of batch ETL jobs that process something like 10 terabytes of data per day. It's unpredictable, right? Kind of comes and goes. It could be 10 terabytes, 2 terabytes, 1 terabyte. They could run 100 jobs, 1,000 jobs. So they use Spark. Uh, Hadoop, Hive, uh, and then they have S3 as a data lake. So that's where kind of all the data is stored. So what they found is that their blended rate, and you see these numbers up here, so I'm going to translate it to percentages. Their blended rate, their mix of ODRI and spot, it was 30% cheaper than if they had just used all three-year RIs. It was also 70% cheaper than if they had just used all on-demand. So you know, Zillow kind of put these things into practice 
on these uh, Hadoop and these Spark workloads, and they're saving 70% in comparison to running the whole thing on on-demand. So the takeaway here is your task nodes, your worker nodes, your processors, convert them to using EC2 fleet, using Spot, and then think about other ways you can save money, whether it's through RIs or maybe even running the short-lived jobs on Spot. Uh, there are a couple of sessions, you're in luck here, uh, on Thursday. Uh, I can highly recommend these. They're led in some cases by PMs or by uh, solutions architects. So this is a really common use case, and we have uh, these sessions for you available tomorrow. Second workload I want to talk about is containers. How many of you are running containers in some fashion or another? Uh, what, what we've heard is about 64% of customers in one fashion or another are running containers, and other people are starting to look at them. This is really the perfect workload for cost optimization, especially thinking about spot. So you can use ECS, you can use EKS. Auto scaling powers the scaling for both of those. You can use EC2 fleet by yourself if you prefer to. Uh, if you're running Kubernetes native, uh, there's a framework called COPS for running that on AWS. So you can look at the tens of thousands of different instances, and already you're really not thinking about instances. You're thinking about how many containers do I need to launch, how many nodes, how many tasks can I fit on those nodes. You can use a lot of different instance types and then just have uh, kind of you know, pack your uh, nodes, pack your with different tasks, and then just look at your task queue, and that's how you scale up and down. And most of those are stateless. You're treating your instances, your containers as cattle, not pets. So this is really the kind of perfect workload for cost optimization. So how does this look? A little bit different than the last reference architecture, and you can see here we have a CloudFormation template. Here what you do is you have an ELB or maybe an ALB, application load balancer, in front of all of your fleet. So that's distributing traffic, it's routing it. And then you have uh, multiple availability zones as opposed to that batch or the Hadoop example where you're in a single availability zone. And then here you still have a single auto-scaling group that covers multiple instance types, it covers your mix of spot, maybe your base, of RI or on demand, and then you store your session state data in some kind of database, right? You could use S3, you know, for Data Lake, you could use Dynamo, I, I don't care what database you use, like we kind of support them all. So this is really straightforward, and again, before you had to make multiple auto scaling groups, now you can make only one. Uh, in terms of savings, you can save a lot of money here too. So this is a customer, Skyscanner, they're a travel fare aggregator. They moved nearly their entire Kubernetes cluster over to Spot, and they're saving 74% over on-demand with almost no application re-architecture. So if you're running Kubernetes, if you're using ECS, if you're running Docker, Rancher, Mesos, you're kind of throwing money away if you're not exploring how you can use Spot much more heavily. We have a lot of container sessions here. Uh, there's one actually tonight, 7 o'clock, but you can't skip out, so catch that on YouTube later. Uh, but we have a couple more tomorrow. So if you're looking at Kubernetes and you want to look into EKS, we have one tomorrow, and then uh, running uh, workloads at scale. So this is really powerful emerging uh, pattern. The last workload I'm going to go into as an example is uh, CI/CD. So how many of you are running continuous integration, continuous deployment? Most of you. Uh, another great use case here. Uh, Jenkins, Bamboo, a lot of different ways to do this. So all you need to do with Jenkins is use uh, the EC2 fleet, the Spot plugin from AWS. It's free. It's open source. Uh, there's a couple of pull requests. You might want to fix those bugs if you get a chance. Uh, it's really simple. So the worker nodes leverage Spot. That's savings of up to 90%. And then uh, right, let me show you the reference example here. So basically, you have an application load balancer, pretty similar to the example that I just used with containers or web apps. You're funneling traffic to a Jenkins master, right, which is running on on-demand or RI. You don't want that to kind of any risk of going down. And then it launches spot instances as agents for the Jenkins CI server, automatically scaling it with load. Uh, by default, we'll try to scale your fleet up using the number of tasks in the build queue, but you can configure that whatever you want. Maybe you don't ever want to have it scale up because you want to maintain you know, super low cost and you don't care how long your CI CD workloads take. But this is really simple. There's almost no code. Matt will talk about this in a minute, but you know, in some cases, it's as little as you know, one line, eight character code change, or four lines of code, and you could be saving thousands of dollars a day. So with that in mind, I think one of the most powerful things here are all of the customers that are using AWS. And uh, I want to introduce Matt Leventi,
who's a principal engineer at Lyft, who's here to talk to you about how he's cost optimizing EC2 and how he's making use of Spot. Matt, welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Is the mic on? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Matt. I'm an engineer at Lyft. I still write code on a daily basis. Um, and I've been there for almost five years. I remember when like, the entire engineering team for Lyft could be like the first two rows here. Those, those days are unfortunately or fortunately long gone, depending on your perspective. Um, we've kind of been with Spot since the beginning. Uh, it's important that like, we, as an engineering shop, run sort of lean on all of our operational costs, because we want to drive as much money into the marketplace as possible, which is the business value. That's like, how much of a discount can we offer you on a given ride? Like, you know, how much of an incentive can we give a driver to drive for a given hour? Those are the numbers the business cares about. The business doesn't want to spend money on AWS, generally speaking. Uh, so four years ago, we started to use Spot. And you can imagine that like four years ago, everything was constantly on fire. So this was actually a choice that someone made that was time they spent on this versus time they spent on something else. That's how sort of impactful it was. And coming up to the current day, now we are in a place where 10% of overall AWS spend is Spot. Uh, that's actually much higher if you look at just EC2. We use a lot of AWS upstream services, which uh, have all had announced improvements today. Um, basically, we're at the millions of hours a month. Um, we try and use Spot across many, many different workloads. I'm going to talk about some examples here, here today. Uh, so how, how you get started. Like most people, they don't want machines to die. And Spot is like, oh, the machine can die, so I don't want to use it. Um, the easiest way to get going is use CI CD, convert CI CD to Spot. You get a little familiar, familiarity with it. CI CD, if it dies, like you rerun the build job, it's not a big deal. The developer waits like another 10 minutes for the commit status on GitHub. Um, but it gives you some place to start with the integration. And then you can start like looking at your other workflows that have similar sort of characteristics. Anything that has fail and retry is a candidate for Spot. So dev environments, um, we do a lot of marketplace simulations, which is like, should we match passenger X with passenger Y in this way, or in this way, or in this way? And, and that requires a lot of compute power. Uh, that mostly all runs in Spot. Uh, all of our sort of open source hosted um, dev tools, be them Jenkins, or Presto, or Spark, or Flink, or Flight, all of it is Spot as well. Basically, all these applications have one thing in common, which is that if there's a failure at the application level, we can get another machine. We don't really care. We can retry. So what does this look like? We have this class of applications, which is sort of fully spot. Um, they're restartable. Everything that's non-prod, they can do things offline. They can do batch. Um, and then we have mixed spot use cases. Uh, mixed spot is uh, for workloads which are scalable, but we can, we can take some amount of uh, failure in the machine pool. Um, so if you can imagine at Lyft, we have many, many more people using Lyft at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. than we do at 4 in the morning, except maybe on Saturday. So because of that, a portion of our fleet is actually like scaling up and scaling down at all times. And a good portion of that fleet is spot, scale up, scale down. So, a little bit on terms of like best practices, how we got here, what, what to do, how to structure your org in a way that you can use Spot in a, in a, in a good sense. Um, we actually spend enough on AWS that we have people that are just a capacity team. It's like three guys. Um, and they, have, they advise teams about what does our I, our I saturation look like, where are we spending money, what instances should you use for different applications. But ultimately, the decision on like spot versus non-spot for a specific app goes down to that engineering team. And we just empower the engineering team to make the right decision. They're aware of how much their stuff costs through cost tagging, which Joshua mentioned. And they can use this to, to essentially reduce the cost of their services. 
Um, we make it really trivial. Uh, every lot of the stuff that we have is provisioned through either SaltStack or Terraform, and spot enablement in either of those systems is essentially nine characters in an auto-scaling group. You just define the spot price, and you're pretty much done. Um, and we, we use auto-scaling groups pretty much everywhere. Uh, that's just best practice. You don't want single servers floating around. Single servers are essentially like pets. Like if you have a single server, it's an EC2 somewhere, and if it dies, no one understands what system it was part of, and it, it's, it's generally a bad practice. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that Spot does come with some additional operational complexity for your eng teams. Um, and as Joshua said, you should evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether you want to you want to take take that small hit. I think a lot of the times it's just very well worth it, um, and it, you're just really leaving money on the on the table by not using it. Um, the only times where it doesn't really make sense is very persistent, durable applications that have very tight latency guarantees like databases. And that's all I have. Um, I hope everyone tries an AV lift ride. It's in Vegas. It's online. You can get between hotels with it. Um, part of that system actually does run on, on spot. <laughs> You're welcome. Always interesting to hear how our customers are innovating and saving money using spot. And I kind of love hearing uh, Matt talk about how the engineering practices have been driven all the way down into the engineering team. So if you want to dive any deeper into CI/CD, uh, obviously one of these was earlier. The other one is tomorrow. All these, most of these are going to be on YouTube later. But these are the kind of workloads that are going to be really friendly for cost savings. So I want to go into one other workload uh, in the time that I have left that might sound a little unusual. Does anybody here watch movies? It's like the worst crowd. Come on, guys. Right, you watch movies? Yay, movies, right? Woo! And uh, any kind of movies. Every movie now, nothing is real. Everything is green screen and visual effects. So that has exploded the amount of compute that people are using. Anybody buy furniture from Ikea? The whole catalog, it's fake. They just render it on a computer with like the seven different versions of the couch that'll fall apart the minute after you get it home. And they use this technology from a company that we acquired called AWS Thinkbox now. And the technology is a render queue manager. It's like a specialty purpose batch application that kind of spins up all of these instances renders the effects, right? If you're watching a movie, there might be smoke and hair and fire. Or if it's an IKEA catalog, it's the different colors that are being applied to the same couch and putting it in a fake living room. And so I think what this uh, does is a company like FuseFX, who spoke at reInvent, they're based out of Los Angeles. They're using uh, Deadline to cost-effectively parallelize their work. So they can finish jobs that would normally take something like 10 hours in their on-premise infrastructure to do in one hour on spot. So when I say jobs, that makes it sound really boring. So I'm going to get to what I mean by jobs. The exciting part of the presentation. All of this you see here is being rendered on AWS. going on here, right? There's all these different layers and visual effects. These trucks were not actually on that highway. possible on AWS, uh, oh, sorry, uh, on AWS using Spot. So from now on, since all of you were pretty excited, I'm just going to talk over visual effects for every speech in the future. Uh, and if you didn't catch it, there was a little Easter egg related to me, yours truly, in that video. So if you were asleep, you can watch this later again on YouTube. If you did catch it, congratulations. Uh, more seriously, if you want to learn about how you could do rendering, uh, doing physical prototyping, you can do that uh, virtually now. You can attend these uh, sessions, or you can uh, catch them on YouTube, or just ask to meet my Thinkbox team. So now I want to tie that all together, right? What are you going to do? How are you going to save money? 
So the first thing, I keep mentioning this, is you're going to look for the obvious workloads that are suitable for spot. Containers, they're being used pretty heavily, and they're kind of growing very rapidly. These are super suitable for spot. CI, CD workloads, you can experiment with spot, maybe mix in a little bit of on-demand for your dev test workloads. Uh, Matt talked about this. Even if you have an on-premise workload that has not traditionally been fault tolerant, it might be ROI positive for you to add checkpointing, like a computational fluid dynamics simulation. If you could save 80% on your commute, compute, or you could get the job done 10 times faster, would it be worth a little bit of engineering effort to kind of checkpoint the job periodically? It probably would be. If you don't have spot in your big data workloads, like I mentioned how obvious this is, maybe attend one of the reInvent workshops that I'm kind of coming on here. So these are the really obvious ways you can save money by layering spot on top of your on-demand and your RI. So what are you going to do? You're going to leave this session. You're probably going to go get dinner and drinks. But maybe after that, maybe after you go to sleep and you wake up the next day. You're going to optimize across all three purchasing models by using EC2 Fleet, either by itself or inside of one of those other services that I mentioned. You're going to right size, meaning pick the smallest instance that actually works for your workload. And you're going to scale based on demand using something like auto scaling, using both predictive scaling and dynamic scaling. They work together. Don't forget to scale down and turn things off when people are not using them. That's an incredibly powerful way to save money if you're only using something during the workday. You're going to use launch templates. This is going to streamline, simplify your launch process. You're going to look for opportunities to use Hibernate, where you can kind of get your instances in that known good state, pre-warm them, have them launch up that much faster. And then as you migrate to AWS and you develop new applications, you are going to architect your workloads with both cost and performance in mind. So one of the biggest tricks right, to not getting yourself into a situation where you need to reactively, in a crisis, control your costs is by figuring out a way that you can incorporate all of these practices into your applications all of the time. So you can get started using these CloudFormation templates. These kind of make it really easy to kind of spin up an environment that resembles the best practices that we've used here. You don't have to use CloudFormation. Also, if any of you have an account manager, if you're using AWS, ask them to schedule. These are three magic words, spot, immersion day, all three words together in that order. Don't just say immersion day, because then that's a bunch of other stuff. This is all that matters, spot immersion day. This is where we bring our solutions architects that are specialists into your environment. You can bring a team of developers together. They can do a hands-on workshop. You don't have to come to Las Vegas to get it. And they can learn how to do cost optimization for whatever workloads matter to you. It doesn't have to be CI, CD. It could be rendering. It could be anything else. This has been extremely powerful. And a bunch of those customers that are now testimonials, their references, this is how they got started, Zillow, Expedia, and so on. Uh, as well, most of you, I think, who came in got the uh, $50 spot credits, little card. That's actually a pretty powerful way to get started on spot. It's already cheap enough, and now I've made it free for the first $50. So uh, with that in mind, in the last minute, just wanted to say thank you very much for coming. I realize there's a lot of information to absorb at a place like reInvent. You have to take time out of your busy schedules. All of you have jobs. Come here. Listen to us. Hopefully, you've heard a lot of new things. We've released a lot of things in the last year that have changed the way spot works, changed the way EC2 works, changed the way auto scaling works. I've tried to cover most of them here today. Uh, and I've learned a lot from you kind of over the years that have fed into these features. We're fond of saying that 90% of our features come from customer requests, with the other 10% us looking around the corner to deliver something to you that you didn't even know you needed. Hopefully, that resembles the experience that you've had with AWS. Uh, and with that in mind, and speaking of feedback, uh, I want to say good night. And please complete your session surveys in the application. That feedback definitely guides not just me, but all of AWS uh, reInvent planning for the next year in terms of what sessions you want to see. So thank you very much. <laughs>